the depot. My name's Linda Blinko and I work closely with Amelia and together um, we thought about this publication as a response to um, an issue that you know we've been very conscious of and over time, very conscious of it indeed, and the way it's affected people, the way it's affected our community, um, the way it's affected people in general, and the fact that it's never discussed. It, it is a rarity to have this issue discussed. And um, Amelia has worked really hard, um, along with Julia and our depot community, to bring together this publication which is a real tribute to those of you who have been a part of it, your, your courage to come forward and um, represent your passion, your emotion, um, your feelings. And so we are very, very honoured to have you all here today. So thank you so much for attending. Thank you so much for contributing to the publication. And thank you so much for supporting the publication and supporting those who have contributed. So, having said that, I'm handing you over to Amelia, who is the mover and the shaker in relation to this. Um, I just have a few really brief um, thank yous to make as well. Um, firstly, to Linda. Um, for initiating this project last year. Um, she applied for funding, I think, at the very start of last year and put us in a position where we could start to do a call out for submissions in July last year. And in that time, 79 contributors um, uh, emailed their work through to me. In fact, I'm meeting a lot of you for the first time today. So thank you to the contributors that have come to that. It's super lovely um, to have you all here. So big thank you to Linda for initiating the project because um, it's, uh, it's quite a brave project to initiate and Linda is just the brave type of person to initiate a project like that. For anybody who knows her, they'll uh, know that. Um, the second group of people I want to thank are the escape artists who had an exhibition here at the depot, the auction of which um, went towards fundraising for this exhibition. So I want to thank the escape artists. Um, again, I want to thank the contributors, 79 people who um, we've sort of uh, have been emailing with me since last July. They've gone through uh, about seven updates with me, conferring over bits of information, and um, it's just so fantastic to have this result from all of their work. Um, so I really, um, really appreciate all the contributors. And those contributors who are here who haven't signed my copy of the book, which is on the desk there, if you could do that um, before you go, I'd be really grateful. Um, the next person I want to thank is Julia West. Um, she is she co-everything the book with me. It's hard to describe exactly what we did because it wasn't so much editing as kind of collating, thinking, planning, dealing, you know, sorting out how we're going to deal with the information. Lots of amazing conversations um, and I'm really just so grateful to Julia. Um, next I want to thank Stuart Shepard who's here from Saw Print. Um, they've been beside us the whole way um, and have provided not only printing but a lot of other kindness and uh, guidance. I really appreciate uh, Stuart Shepard and really recommend dealing with them. They, Stuart organised, uh, finally finished the binders to do the binding of this edition for free. Um, so we're really grateful to finally finish as well. Uh, lastly, I want to thank my colleagues and my family. Um, and then I want to announce that we're going to have one, two, three, four, five, six, eight contributors who are going to be reading their work. They'll be Heidi North Bailey, Richard Von Sturmer, Aaron Crowell, James Eastell, Vanessa Krofsky, Natasha Lay, Julia West, and Caitlin Smith, who just arrived. Um, so, what I thought I'd do is um, invite Heidi to come up and say her piece first. Um, perhaps if you could stand here just so I can get you in the shot. Okay, that would be great. So, thank you. Thank you very much.
this, this book is amazing. Well done. It's great to have it. So this is my poem. We are tiny beneath the light. This is not the life you want. If you could unremember your past, miss that turning, you could live. But what if there is only this shabby moment? Would you stay with me, share this awful wine? everything. So if you want to know about everything, uh, it's been <laughs> published by um, a Tawindui Press. It's a sort of a, a memoir about the adventure story, Lord and Tawan. But um, the poem uh, for this collection is one called Night Hall. Fragments of a window pane shattered by a fist fly back and reform a single sheet of glass. The scar on the wrist, faded still, draws a pale line beneath the passing years. Nothing is ever lost. You head into the wind, a little stronger for all that has gone before. And even the faintest, stars are shining like frost above the empty streets. behind warning spattered chain link upon a grey sea of rain swept and sunburnt concrete air conditioning units plod stoically onward through encroaching lichen among the forest of wind bitten lampposts these roaring hulks of graffiti stained metal overpainted ad nauseum in eternal gangland war while parking lot paint slowly fades demarcation and order receding so many times I stood here sat here Lay here, watching stars evaporate and clouds fade. My rooftop kingdom of urban isolation, where even rust decays and dust corrodes under the pressure of a thousand empty days. I am one with this sunburnt concrete, this hell hot tin, framed by spanless deserts of grime soaked brick and tile. Above the city, above the noise, above the pollution, above the people. Alone with my thoughts, to contemplate the wind until night falls, to see rivers of lights laid out below, shimmering and distant, reality floating on traffic hum and filtered laughter from a world rushing at terminal velocity and separated from all of it by these invisible walls. Apart from it, yet still a part of it. Even in this loneliness, there is wonder. Even in this decay, there is life. Even in this mind-numbing void, there is hope. There are beautiful things outside, if you only stop to see. Don't jump. Semicolons. 11 years old. 
the middle of the night, I sneak down to the kitchen to turn the light. I take down a glass jar of pills I was taking at the time for epilepsy. Big, red, translucent things that look like you should give them to a horse to kill it. <laughs> Half a bottle goes skittering out across the kitchen and cabinet. And so, uh, gleaming in the light, and a blo uh, bloated blood cup. From the cheap cask in the refrigerator, I take my first and last ever glass of white wine. And I swallow down these pregnant rubies and handles of three or four at a time. I rinse out the glass, I go back to bed, expecting in the morning to be dead. I don't die. I just make myself very, very, very sick. And uh, that's my first semicolon moment, the time when my story could have ended, but it didn't. And I've had over 30 years from that day to this day, 30 years of sunsets and sunrises, of friends and family, of hope and disappointment, of success and epic, epic failure. And I owe all of those 30 years to the fact that at 11 years old, I had no idea what I was doing. Lesson one, a second chance is a gift. You grab it with both hands. Lesson two is don't trade away 10,000 tomorrows just to escape a shitty today. Don't do it, it's not worth it. You're only given one life to make the most of, and you can't make the most of it if you most of it away. Fast forward about 10 years, middle of the day this time, but again, I'm in a very, a very low ebb. The gray mist has descended so thick, it's the only thing I can see clearly. It's family stuff, and money stuff, and study stuff, and this time, there's a woman involved. I'd like to say I don't remember anything about her, but I remember everything about her, from the perfection of her fingertips, to the asymmetry of her nose, to the wavelength of her hair. Sadly, not my wavelength. I'm standing there weighing all my problems, and the calculus and geometry of despair leads me to only one conclusion. The only logical thing is to put down that weight, to put down my pen, to end my story there and then, but something inside me, some spark, some semicolon made me try one thing, one call to one person. 373 999 extension 8963. Alan Eastfield, Dad, it's me. I need you to come home right now. I'm on my way. So, lesson three if you're going to do this, if you're determined to do this, you don't have to do it today. You can do it tomorrow, you can do it next week or next month, it's the same end result. Give yourself one chance, give yourself a semicolon. Reach out to the one person you know will grab hold of you and won't let go. Because, lesson four, it is people, it is people, it is people that will carry us through every single time. We say we're born alone and we die alone, but that's such bullshit. It's the bullshittiest thing we say, it's one of the stupidest things as well. We're born in a room full of people, in a world full of people. We are passed from the still lake of our mothers to the roaring, thundering, crashing river of humanity. Just like those river stones, we bash and crash our way along, knocking all the hard edges off each other. Till by the end, we're unrecognizable except for the marks of the impact of every human being we've ever met. Anyway, Dad comes home that day, and I can't look him in the eye. I'm, I'm stammering, I'm stuttering, I'm crying, I can't even form words. But fortunately, Dad and I always got on okay without too many words, and he knows. And he comes up with some pretty good words of his own. Jesus, he says, don't you know what that would do to me? So lesson five. If you do this, the people who you love and who love you will be wounded beyond repair. If you do this, you will break them so badly they will never be whole again. And you're not that selfish. And you're not that cruel. And I know this because you feel this way. And you have to care to feel this way. You have to be open to people to feel this way. The selfish and the cruel sleep just fine at night. Darkness and solitude hold no fears for them. So whatever your beliefs, it comes to this. Your life is a gift. Paid for in blood. There's no refunds, no exchanges, full stop. Don't do it, full stop. Try, comma, try any other thing that you can, full stop. Give yourself tomorrow, semicolon.
Lisa Kofsky. And so I turned up and um, had my first um, visit to Amelia's attic, where she works from. And um, she's a very good listener, <laughs> very compassionate. And as a result, um, because I had some spare time and I had some skills in the communications and layout business, we ended up working on it together and had a really fantastic time considering it was such a challenging project. And the subject matter is, many of you um, either do know already or will know when you've read the book. It's pretty, pretty edgy, some of it, you know. It's, um, taking some risks. Some people have taken some huge risks to um, express 
some really uh, difficult parts of their lives. And, um, and I think, you know, all credit to Linda for, um, for bringing up, a, for putting out a publication called The War in Silence because, you know, we have huge stigma in this country around suicide and, um, and it's happening big time, frequently. And I sat down yesterday in my five minute sphere and I wrote down the number of people that I had lost in my short life and there was five, um, four of the men in their 40s, um, all for different reasons. Um, a guy in his 50s, um, who, was a friend of my, who was a friend of my grandparents and didn't turn up for dinner one night. And my father and my grandfather went to his house the next morning and found him um, dead. Um, and also a good friend of mine who I worked with who um, uh, slashed your wrists over a relationship breakout and ran away from hospital when I was in my early 30s, I suppose. And I actually just spoke to her this morning for the first time in 15 years. So it's really amazing. She's doing really well. Though. She's got an eight-year-old daughter. Um, and, and the one thing I did want to say, um, which is why I've got my favourite shoes on, is that um, I attempted suicide myself um, four or so years ago, and I never told anyone. Um, well, I didn't intend to tell anyone, right? Because it's really shameful. So not only do we have stigma around people who are loved ones who have chosen to take their own lives um, out of what I um, believe is huge pain and a huge um, um, gap around how we communicate and connect to each other. Um, I um, certainly don't condone it, but I just think it's an absolute tragedy. But um, the reason I'm saying about the fact that I did um, made a pretty good attempt to, um, to take my own life um, through some pretty dire circumstances and um, I think we really just need to pay attention to each other. Um, I think we really need to watch those people that we love, the people around us, really pay attention to what's going on for other people. Because often we miss it. We miss what's going on in other people's lives because we're all so damn busy. And we've all got such rich and full lives, and stressful lives ourselves. So I really sort of encourage anyone in this group, if you know someone that you love that's, um, that's struggling, pay attention. Um, be present for them, you know, just be present. And that's not talking and that's not trying to solve their problems or fix anything. It's really about just being present to them, to whatever they have going on in their lives. And building trust so that they might open up and tell you what's really going on. Because it's not easy to do when you're at the bottom of the, at the bottom of the U, you know, and we all end up at some point at the bottom of the U. Um, it's a really scary place to be and it's really hard to speak out and, and, and speak out. And I can say that because I'm pretty particular on a good day, but I can guarantee, I can tell you that when I was in that bad, bad, bad space, and unfortunately I had a really, really huge difficulties amongst my family, so I couldn't turn to the people I would normally turn to. Um, it's a really hard place to speak up for. So we have to really watch and pay attention to those we love. We have to be present, we need to build trust. Uh, we need to stay connected to people even if they're a pain in the ass and they're sick of hearing the same old story again and again and again. Which is what happens if you don't express yourself properly. You end up repeating the same shit. Because we're not getting to the bottom. I can see Kate and what they yeah. That's encouraging. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not talking about <laughs> bullshit. Um, yeah, so you just, yeah, I just really wanted to say that and to share that with you all. And um, to say that um, for me it wasn't about hope, it was actually about surrendering. I survived and I actually shouldn't have, um, but I did. And um, I wasn't grateful, I was really fucked up about it at the time. I was really pissed off. I was pretty angry, eh? And, um, um, but I did and I realised that, you know, I'd been a reason for that. And so um, I didn't bounce out of there and sort of figure it out, it just taken me some time. But, um, but I can say that in the end for me it was around surrendering to these lives that, as James just said, you know, the gift that we've been given in the life that we have. And also for me, it's about the work that I do with other people and for other people in the love that I give. And that's the key to the world, really, isn't it? It's about loving, figuring out how to love people, even if we don't know what they're thinking and feeling. So um, that's pretty much me. And the other thing I wanted to say um, was really about art. And I'm a writer, you know, I, I, I always carry one of these around and I, and I do lots of scribbling and drawing and writing. Um, and what I discovered is actually that art was the way, uh, it was art that took me um, into the core of what was really 
underneath all my distress and the trauma that I haven't actually faced up to. Um, so I just wanted to make a call out firstly to the depot for their huge generosity and the huge spirit and the care and compassion that each person shows here, especially Amelia, Lynn, Blanco, Lynn and the other people that work here. It's been an absolute privilege to be part of the team here. Um, as, a, as a sort of a pseudo volunteer that comes in there quite frequently just to get some work done quietly. <laughs> Um, and to say that, yeah, art is an amazing thing. And, I, and there's a guy in the country, I heard Taika Waititi talking on Radio New Zealand this week, and he said some really interesting things. And he has huge um, compassion and talked about youth, um, youth risk, youth at risk, and suicide. So he's got things going on around there. And there's also a really amazing artist um, out here at the moment called Jean Marc Carvey, who's French, who um, had a pretty colourful life and ended up a pretty heavy duty hero in it and was trying to suicide and didn't quite make it and ended up throwing paint all over the walls and he's become a really renowned artist. Um, he's actually in the country at the moment and he's travelling around talking to youth at risk about his own journey and if you look him up online you'll see his pretty intense stunning work. Um, but I just wanted to show you one piece because you know you've never become family because I'm telling you one deeper start secret. I just wanted to show you and um, I'm, you know, like I've got a, I'm doing an art therapy training this year because um, I, I developed a mental block when I was about three years old at Kindy and my mother left me behind that I couldn't fall. I've had that block ever since. And I went to this workshop last weekend with this guy, Jean-Marc Carvalho, who told us all just to really shape of the face and then just to paint our stories inside the face, which is what he does. He tells us stories by writing, or no, by drawing an incredible detail into his face. And so I did this little thing, so I just thought I'd share it as a closing note. Because of course I write, I don't draw, right? So this is what I ended up with. So that's my face, and that's just my thoughts, etc. over the last day. And so even doing this, when I had a bit of a rugged day yesterday because of other stuff happening, I just added a few little notes here to myself. And it was really, really stunning. It just completely and utterly um, took away my distress and put me back into the present. And I guess that's the other thing, it's learning how to stay in the present moment, isn't it, really? Mm -hmm. And so I just thought I'd share it with you. Okay, thanks for listening. Um, now I've got one person officially left on my list, and I thought that I'd just um, do a last chance. Are there any contributors that are here that would like to speak to their work? Um, Okay, that's great. Um, now uh, I've got Caitlin Smith on my list. Caitlin is going to sing us a song or two. So thank you, Caitlin. <laughs> Congratulations. It's come to being because it's been a long time coming. And Amelia's work and Linda's um, vision and everyone else contributing, thank you so much to those people who have already um, spoken. Aaron and Heidi and James and Richard and Natasha and um, I hope I'm not Vanessa, beautiful. Um, I wrote a song when I was 12 called Suicide. I couldn't sleep the whole year that I was 14 pretty much. Um, and it's, I lost four friends to suicide in 2014 alone. And um, I think the song kind of came out of that time. And it's called a life worth living. Born the youngest child of the youngest child, and blown by a high-pitched wind from the branches of the trees to walk alone into the deep Farther than the eye can see. She tried every day to fly away, but nets and strings had clipped her wings and made her body stay. And so she scoured the shore and the ocean. On the wrecks that had sunk before, and still she needed more. 
And so she went down, excavated the stone she had to drown. Under Venus and Mars, so until one day she was swept away by a sailor junk on the sea, and his promises of a life that was worth living, a life worth living. Navigating the years through salty tears, she would know. Solid ground felt like beneath her feet. Her wings were torn by a raging storms, and many pirates sought to sink their hooks into her. They would. Bright and brave as the gallant slave, her love would flip from ship to ship. He shunned the comfort that she gave, cause he preferred the rocking of the bottles. Ways. And so he went down, excavated the stars he had to drown. Under Venus and Mars. To find peace, she loves the love she never had. It's well worth the cost of sadness and suffering. She dug deep into a well divined inside her and mind and shining found the treasure. She said, if I free you today from my memory, and if I, I cast the ashes out to sea, now we ruin up in this heart of mine for the cause of a sanctuary.
hyphen web, and it's an ongoing portal. Um, so what I'm hoping is that contributors will all keep in touch, and anyone who's been, say, inspired by today's proceedings can um, get in touch with us, and we keep uh, basically the conversation going, and we keep this network of 79 people who have come together. Um, we keep the kind of communication going between us all. So um, I'll be emailing that link to contributors when it's um, a bit more ready, but uh, just have hope that the conversation continues. So, yep, thanks everyone.